So namaste to me. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Thank you very much. Namaste and thanks for having me. Yeah, no, thank you for being here. It's a big honor. Um, so Kumi, growing up uh, in the apartheid world, what would be, if at all, any experience that you have of, you know, your first introduction to the idea of nonviolence? So for me, the first introduction probably was very consciously at the age of 15. But subliminally, we had already heard, learned about Mahatma Gandhi and Satyagraha and Gandhi's uh, contribution to the South African struggles and the idea of um, resisting injustice through peaceful means was an idea that caught hold very quickly. The most vivid example I have is at the age of 16, I was given a um, essay topic. Uh, my class was given an essay topic to compare and contrast two people that you admired. And I wrote about uh, Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi. And the main area of difference was that Mahatma Gandhi had embraced um, passive resistance and and while both Mandela and Gandhi both embraced civil disobedience, Mandela also uh, recognized in the context of South Africa at that time that there was a need for armed struggle given what he said just before he went to prison while he was on the run. In the 60s, he said, the only language that the oppressor in our country understands is the language of violence. And therefore, we feel duty bound uh, with lots of reluctance. And he had a very nice phrasing. He said, the response of the apartheid state to peaceful efforts at resistance has been a unleashing of a terrible set of violence against an unarmed and peaceful um, citizenry. And so so quite early, actually, by the age of 16, I, and I remember the English teacher that I had to mark that essay came into the class and flung the book at me and said, you are making me mark something like this, which is going to get me into trouble by saying all the radical things that you are saying in your essay. Go and choose somebody else, you know. And 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 I remember feeling quite crushed by it because I thought I had done a really good, sensitive job as the sixteen-year-old. So so I guess the introduction to that tension between how do you resist a violent apartheid state when you are persistently coming up against very high levels of violence. But if your inclinations were still as was and is mine mm. to continue to embrace the power of nonviolence uh, as a way of resisting um, injustice uh, was always there from an early age. And then you know, as the struggle in South Africa in the late 80s intensified and more and more young people, including many close friends of mine and even myself as a underground member of the Mandela's movement, had to confront the issue that even though I was not engaged in armed struggle myself, that I was part of a movement that actually engaged in it. So there were four pillars in the South African struggle, mass mobilization, international solidarity, the political underground, and armed struggle. So I was involved in basically three of the four, right, in the sense of um, uh, being involved in mass mobilization, which was mostly where my energies went to. When I was in exile between 87 and 90, the ages of 22 and sort of 26, 
Um, I did a lot of work on the international solidarity pillar, as we call it, four pillars of resistance. And then, of course, I was part of the political underground. And so the distance to armed struggle was not that far because you were part of the same movement. And most of the young people, of course, you know, very, very strongly were seeing the friends being murdered. We were in funerals every other weekend, bedding uh, activists and friends that had been murdered. So let's put it this way. The environment was much more fertile to gravitate towards embracing um, violence and armed struggle. And to be honest, while I was not actively involved in it, I had a lot of sympathy for the efforts at uh, nonviolence. But the one thing the ANC did as a very strong policy was, you know, it had a distinction between what it called hard targets and soft targets. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it had a very strong view that civilians should not be attacked and so on. There were a few incidents where militants of the ANC put bombs in places where civilians did die, uh, especially as we got closer and closer to the final capitulation of the apartheid state. Um, and and so it wasn't fashionable at all to say, you know, I'm for nonviolence, but it is something that in most of all that we did really was in the space of civil disobedience and, and nonviolence. Thank you. To me also, there's a big question of uh, whether passive resistance gets properly uh, you know, distinguished from nonviolence. Gandhi was certainly at pains to say that uh, if passive resistance was a term he did not uh, prefer because it implies letting the harm being uh, or letting the injustice be done to you. Uh, and of course, later on, even Martin Luther King agrees with Gandhi that it is better uh, to use a very contained violence than to be a coward. So was yeah, this... Any Anything on this that you would like to add? Yes, no, no. That, that was a lot of the conversations that were going on at that time, right? Um, and I, I just would give you one example, right? Mm -hmm. So the apartheid state used divide and rule as a strategy to contain the resistance, right? And this meant... Uh, employing a lot of collaborators and resourcing them. And I remember being at a workshop with the person that is today the highly inefficient police minister of our country. But at that time, he was quite an efficient activist. And I remember we were being, in our province, there were thousands of people that were killed by the movement called Inkata, at that time that was aligned to the apartheid government, which was um, led by this um, leader called um, Mangasutu Butelezi. And, and, and so I remember Beijing Ele saying, if you live in a community and we know that the state or in Qatar or combination of them were planning to come and attack you, right? Is it self-defense to wait for them to attack you? Or if you had all the evidence that they were going to attack you, do you actually attack them before they attack you? So there were those kinds of conversations that were going on all the time. And I remember interviewing for my PhD thesis that looked at the question of how Indian South Africans participated in the liberation struggle. It was called Class, Comma, Consciousness and Organization, Indian Political Resistance to Apartheid from 79 to 99. Mm -hmm. And I remember interviewing an activist called Pingla Udit, who was uh, very uh, 
uh, committed activists who spend time in solitary confinement and, and so on. And in the interview that I did with her, she said, most of the young people now are not that sort of enthused by Mahatma Gandhi's message of uh, passive resistance, right? And, and, but having said that, a lot of the strategies that Gandhi used in South Africa and subsequently in India continued to be a key part of the menu of what the resistance to apartheid was all about. Mm -hmm. So right in, say, 2000, and, sorry, 1999, sorry, I beg your pardon, right in as late as 1989, like a year before Mandela would be released from prison, uh, there was a defiance campaign on the beaches, you know, where the beaches were restricted to white people only and like thousands of people mobilized and went onto the beaches on that day and went to the so-called white beaches. And that was like classic sort of uh, resistance using a nonviolent method, right, to get attention and to get the policy changed. And so, um, and and I, I I don't know whether this quotation really exists, but one of the things that we were told in the course of these debates that Gandhi once said, given the choice between perpetual say, slavery and violence, he would choose violence over perpetual slavery. Now I don't know whether he said that or not, but that was. <laughs> it, it sounds very consistent. Yeah, so 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 those the you know so, so in the debates and all you know at that stage I wasn't as uh, concerned about being as factually accurate as I try to be these days. So I was liberally quoting that you know uh, because especially if you were mobilizing amongst South Africans of Indian origin who add still a broad affinity to the legacy of Gandhi would say, but you know, Gandhi wouldn't want us to do this. And then we would say, well, Gandhi actually would probably agree with Mandela right now that given the choice between perpetual slavery and, and, and violence, even though you regret violence, even though you know it is demeaning, you know that it, whoever perpetrates it is minimizing their value and reducing their sense of morality, sometimes the situation actually calls for it. So yes, there were definitely conversations, debates, and sometimes violent disagreements around it, you know, where people um, would really... I, I remember running a children's home at that point at the age of 19 and 20. I was a living house father in a children's home. And one of the boys at the children's home was like really very intelligent and very, you know, kind of, but he loved debating and he was broadly in support of the ANC. But when there was a bomb that was planted in Durban at a post office and when two civilians died, right, it completely freaked him out, right? And I remember him taking me on and saying, you know, um, we cannot support the ANC any longer if the ANC does these things, you know. Yeah. So nobody loved, you know, one of the things that I think it's important to just remind ourselves is there is so much of state terrorism as we're seeing happening to the, right now in the Gaza and in Palestine. We see it perpetually around the world where state terrorism and state violence is used to subjugate people and to maintain an unjust status quo. And that violence, whether it is through overt means or whether it's through more subtle means, is a violence that the oppressed have to live with all the time, right? And nobody knows the pain of violence like oppressed peoples anywhere in the world. You know, even if you look at India and if you look at the Dalit community within the caste structure of India, right? Nobody knows the violence of policies, you know, like the Dalit people knows, knows them, right? And so 
it's a myth to think that people who live under oppressive regimes have any sort of natural affinity to violence. In fact, they have the most kind of bad experience of violence. So when they are forced to even consider it and take it up, I believe it's generally done in whichever struggles that I've studied, not with like gusto and enthusiasm and so on, but it's done with a sense of regret and a sense that uh, we wish we didn't have to do this. But as Mandela put it, if the oppressor only understands the language of violence and all other languages don't actually resonate, then sometimes you have to, you know, uh, yeah. sadly go down that route. And yet he journeyed. So Kumi, could you perhaps here uh, share your understanding of Mandela's journey through those 30 odd years? Uh, you know, to the point where he comes out saying that if I had not left my bitterness behind in Robben Island, I know that I would always remain in a prison no matter how freely I roam the world. So what is what is this journey? If you could just describe that, please. So it's important to understand when Mandela advocated for armed struggle, firstly, he did it very reluctantly. Secondly, it was with deep regret. But also, it was particularly focused on how do you prevent worse-scale anarchic, sporadic violence. Because at that time, there were certain smaller movements sort of saying, if we can get every black domestic worker that works in a white family home to poison everybody on a similar day, we'll deal with the problem, for example, right? There was talks about more sporadic acts of violence that could be organized and so on. And one of the things he said was, we need to channel the anger of our people into a disciplined way. We're not going to be able to do that by solely uh, mass mobilization where the state perpetually mows down people and kills people. And by organizing a very disciplined, narrow focused uh, arm struggle that is aimed at state infrastructure, right, and state agents, then that will channel some of the boiling anger that people were having to the violence that was meeting, meted out to the apartheid state. So to start with, you know, that was his inclination. And then when he went to his treason trial, which was called the Ravonia treason trial, because that was where they were found on a farm called Ravonia, he said in the trial, and there's a big story about how his lawyer, a white gentleman called George Besos, asked him to add three words to his statement. His original statement was, I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination all my life. And if necessary, I'm prepared to die because... Uh, no, no, and he said, and I'm prepared to die. And I'm prepared to die and face the consequences because when the trial was coming up, it was very close about whether they would get life imprisonment or the death penalty. And it was a lack of, it was like 50-50 kind of thing, right? And his lawyer the night before convinces him to add three words. And those words were, I have fought against black domination and I've fought against white domination. And if needs be, if needs be, I'm prepared to die for my principles. And, and so even that statement, if needs be, was again not embracing it in any kind of major uh, sort of romanticizing the revolutionary sort of profile that, you know, some people think uh, revolutionaries uh, seek to do. So his time in prison, though, also would have been very instructive for him because 
after he gets thrown in prison in the 60s, the black consciousness movement emerges and with Steve Biko and 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 while he's on prison in the 70s, a bunch of young people after the Soweto uprising in 1976 arrives on Robben Island with no uh, inclination towards the ANC policy position about embracing white South Africans as part of the struggle, for example. Uh, and, and he had to deal with difference within the context of prison and learn to respect people of different ideologies within the liberation movement, and especially intergenerational respect, right? Because these were younger people who were coming full of anger Right, having experienced the apartheid state, and we're very much of the view that there was no goodness left in the white oppressor, right? And any sort of compromise or any softening was not there. So he had to listen to all of this, absorb that, be respectful, and he won over the majority of the the young people. They all came out, not all, the majority of them came out as sort of ANC sympathizers. Uh, a few didn't, actually, and continued to hold a view different from that which Mandela held. Um, and so, but also Mandela was a realist. He understood the balance of power. He understood that what we were facing in South Africa was a bloodbath, which is what everybody in the world anticipated, right? That tens of thousands of people would be murdered if they resisted. And that even though black, the black community had numbers on their side, they did not have weapons and armed sophistication on their side. So, um, so he had always urge the resistance, not always publicly, but behind the scenes, is build, organize your power and all of that, and be as strong as you can, but don't rule out dialogue and engagement with the oppressor. So when the resistance got strong enough in the late 80s, he was making it well known to the apartheid regime that he was ready for dialogue. However, he didn't want dialogue on their terms. So when they asked him, even in the late 80s, uh, actually in the mid 80s, in 85, they offered him uh, a release from prison, right? And they said they will release him from prison if he denounced violence and the armed struggle. Well, if he denounced the armed struggle, that would have mean denouncing the ANC. Right, and he patently refused to do that. Right, uh, and so the important thing about what he said is what anybody who's been to personal or public trauma could say. That is, you never heal if you cannot forgive the person who perpetrated that trauma and violence on you, right? And so, um, so I think, and, and, and also Mandela understood, you know, he always said, bear in mind, our struggle is not against white people. Our struggle is against a system of white oppression and yeah. uh, domination, right? Yeah. And so he always could see the humanity yeah. of people, even if they were on the other side. So that's why, for example, his prison warden, right, became very close to him. In fact, the whole world was waiting for him to be released from prison. The cameras of the world were outside, and he was having an emotional goodbye with his prison warden, who he invited to his inauguration, right? And, he, you know, you would advise him on his children, uh, their studies, and everything. Yeah, right? Uh, so some people might say, ha, he was being naive. Others would say, 
he was being realistic. He understood how people are manipulated by leaders, you know. I mean, when I look at a country like India and I see what's happening today with the rise of Islamophobia, do you sort of blame that on a political leadership which is actively misleading people, manipulating people, mobilizing people on that basis? Or do you blame the people who get misled into joining some of these horrific acts that have been carried out uh, against minorities in India at the moment, right? So he, he always tried to sort of suggest, correctly so, that white people were also oppressed. They were mentally oppressed. They were sold a lie of superiority that could never be real and could never be maintained. So, so he brought that kind of wisdom into the ANC as he left prison. And thankfully, you know, he was able to prevail. Mm. And one of the things that did help is the fact within the liberation movement, some of our most loved activists and leaders came from within the white community, mm. right? The leader of the ANC's armed struggle, right? The military wing of the ANC was Joe Slovo, a Jewish white South African, right? And when people sang Liberation Strong, in fact, to be honest, many young people, including myself, the first time we sang Joe Slow's name in songs and all, we thought he was a black guy, right? <laughs> right? Only to discover later on that actually, uh, you know, he was a white South African. His wife, Ruth First, had been murdered by the regime through a letter bomb in Mozambique. And then the head of ANC intelligence, or one of the key people in ANC intelligence, was a guy called Ronnie Kestrel, who would become the Minister of Intelligence in a democratic South Africa, right? He as well was a white Jewish South African again. And, um, and so you, and our movements, all the mass movements that we're building, our trade union movements and so on, had uh, South African patriots who were from the white community who stood up and joined with the liberation struggle. And he also understood how difficult that choice was for many people and the consequences for them with their families being rejected in their own community and so on. And I see an analogy, by the way, in the present moment we find ourselves, when I have been so moved to see thousands and thousands of Jewish people standing up and saying, not in my name, the ceasefire must stop, and so on. But I can see the same consequences that white South Africans face standing up with against the apartheid system is the same consequences that human rights loving Jewish people around the world are facing right now yeah. when they stand up and say, the Israeli state has become an apartheid state and therefore does not deserve our support. Indeed, indeed. See, I think, Kumi, one of the biggest challenges we all face, and I think we're all facing it in our day-to-day -day life uh, and activism, is there seems to be a very common tendency to demonize your opponent. I don't know if it happens because, uh, you know, there's some instinct which says that if you demonize your opponent, then you will have more energy for the struggle. Um, and all that you've just, you know, told me, I didn't know the story about the prison warden. Uh, one is the, the ability to distinguish the offense and the person who at this moment may be the committer of that offense. And the other is that even if the uh, uh, you know, the opponent is saying and doing horrible things. How do we still not dehumanize them? How, how, what is, what is that? You know, what is your insight on the how? Because even say, I mean, okay, you know, the Israel-Palestine situation just now at one level is 
so stark. Um, but I'm afraid that a lot of demonization of, uh, you know, the Israeli people is also happening at the moment. And that doesn't help. Uh, no. I mean, enough people are making the distinction between the people and the state. Yeah. How, what On a day-to-day -day basis, how are you grappling with this? You know, how can one be constructive and creative in these times? So, me, I had the benefit of having a mum who told me something when I was very young, when I was being told at school by a very famous teacher, a very uh, popular teacher, who, was, who had converted his religion and was saying, you know, my God doesn't ask for this and my God doesn't ask for chickens and, uh, and uh, you know, the slaughter of animals as happens in some religions. And um, and I went home and I said to my mom, you know, this teacher says, uh, I was brought up as a Hindu and 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 uh, said that Hinduism is not the best religion. And my mother said, you know, the only religion you need is to see God in the eyes of every human being that you meet, right? And focus on the weaknesses in yourself and focus in the strengths of others, because you might be some be able to do something about the weaknesses in yourself. You're never going to be able to do something. Uh, about the weaknesses in others because those weaknesses can only be addressed when those people decide within their hearts and souls that they want to change. Sadly, my mom committed suicide two years after she told me that at the age of 38 and I was 15. But it's a wisdom personally I have carried through, throughout my life and I have found it to be a very beautiful wisdom. It's simple. It's about understanding why people act in the way they act, right? And I've come to realize, as has been suggested by philosophers, uh, you know, from the 1970s onwards, that one of the mistakes we make in understanding the balance of power and how governments and corporations control people as much as they do is that we think that that control is exercised primarily through the deployment of the repressive state apparatus, by which I mean army, police, formal laws, formal rules and regulations, and so on. Now, it is true that the repressive state apparatus is very powerful. It shapes the theater of uh, public life, political life, civic life. But actually the more insidious and more powerful form of control is not the repressive state apparatus, but it is the ideological state apparatus, by which I mean the framework for religion, the framework for education, the frameworks for the funding of arts and culture, and most importantly, the frameworks for communications and media. Right, And so I have seen how people can be manipulated to actually hold horrendously uh, violent views, racist views, anti-Semitic views, Islamophobic views, um, you know, all of this, right? And so when I see a working class person articulating something that is different from my opinion, and I know that that person has not had the benefit of education like some of us have had, and, and they are operating on very limited inputs of distorted facts or lies, right? You have to, a good activist is not about blaming those people and, and, and attacking them even more. Good activism is about figuring out how do I shift those people from the views that they hold to the views that will serve humanity in a better way. Now, particularly since the terrorist attacks in New York City and Washington DC in September 2001, we have seen the so-called democracy 
promoting countries of the world do a terrible, terrible disservice to the cause of democracy. The United States in particular, through the Patriot Act, demonized and shrunk democratic space. So ever since the utterly problematic response to the crime against humanity the, uh, that was committed on 9-11-2001. We saw the so-called war on terror that gave a blank check to various state authorities to crack down on dissent, whether they were in any way associated with uh, Al-Qaeda or the people who perpetuated those attacks or not. And the framing of George Bush then was you're either with us or you're against us, right? And if you take, in a way, the making of Donald Trump is partly rooted in that moment, right? Because what has happened now, it's all them versus us, right? And it's the othering of people that are different and the weaponizing of identity and religion and uh, whether it's even on things like sexual orientation and all of these things, right? You are seeing the push towards othering rather than a push towards belonging, right? And so... Sadly, we're seeing this today in far too many places. And one of the ways in which you can win political power, sadly, right, is about finding a group and going after that group and demonizing that group and energizing your base to support you and be passionate in their support for you. So today it's extraordinary. After all the crimes that Donald Trump has committed, he still has 30% of solid support amongst the American people. You've got to see those people, as Mandela taught us, as victims, right? They've been sold a lie, right? Yeah. And the way the ideological state apparatus is organized in the United States, right? The state doesn't generally need to use repressive state apparatus that much because the the ideological state apparatus has people having to a core number having an Islamophobic attitude, racist attitudes. Uh, you know, when Trump called certain countries in my continent, Africa, shit old countries that resonated with some chunk of the people and so on. This is happening all over the world right now. We are seeing the rise of fascism. We are seeing the rise of Racism, we're seeing the rise of xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and all of that, right? Because it is convenient for certain opportunistic politicians when they've got nothing else going for them, where they have no vision about how to address climate change, how to address inequality, how to address gender discrimination, and so on, then the easiest way to rouse up your base is to find some group to attack and demonize them. In this polarizing world that we live in, people who believe that humanity must find common ground to address actually the big problems of our time, because all of these things are distractions from the real issues that humanity faces. I mean, climate change right now basically threatens humanity's existence, Yeah. right? And we are spending time on pouring billions and billions in armaments in, Rus in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. We're seeing it again now uh, with the West just blindly wanting to give more weapons to Israel and so on. Uh, and basically... That's the kind of resources that should be going into the solutions around climate change. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And and if you look if you look at what threatens human security, um, in a more fundamental way, 
it's those kinds of issues. And, and let me just conclude by saying, part of the problem we have in dealing with this problem of violence and security and peace and so on is that we have had too much of the framing of security in a national security framework rather than in a human security framework. And part of the, our challenge is to, I think, increase our affinity, understanding, embracing of the need for approaching uh, security with the human security lenses. And as I and others have said many times before, that hunger is a it's weapon of mass destruction. Right? Is. Hunger is a weapons of weapon of mass destruction. And it's the first human security issue. Absolutely. Before Absolutely. everything else. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So could we, we live in a time of great paradox because over the last 70 years across the world, I think both the theory and practice of nonviolence has expanded. At least that's what my research is showing. Then you have, from your experience, you know, the historic effort of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I, I understand that, you know, there are many views on the outcomes and uh, the, the, you know, the, maybe the jury will be out a long time about whether it worked and to what extent it worked. But the fact that it was attempted. And here we are, you know, what is it now? Almost 30 years since apartheid ended, or it is 30 years, sorry, it is 30 years. And the world, as you said just now, is more and more polarizing. I mean, quite frankly, my generation of, uh, you know, activists, I'm 65 now. I'm not in our wildest nightmares. Did we think that this is the world we would live in as, Absolutely. Would, as senior citizens? Absolutely. Right. We were just Absolutely. brought up. We were just brought up on a kind of, you know, positive progression towards uh, the fundamentals of right to life, right to dignity, equal and unconditional for all. So in this context, you know, what do you how do you see the present? I mean, what are some of the things that you would say to young people who and I do I meet a lot of young people you know, both from schools and colleges, I get talk, I get called to, you know, talk to them. And I see a lot of them want to move towards all the values that we hold dear. Because I think that's a basic human instinct. They don't have to be ideologically indoctrinated or anything. Yeah. So nonviolence and and by here I'm using the term nonviolence as to mean justice and dignity for all. But they are daunted. They feel overwhelmed. And above all, they think or they fear rather that technology is now making it harder. That there's something inherently polarizing about the technological moment in which we find ourselves. So kind of in closing, you know, what, what advice or what observations would you share with these young people? So firstly, let me give you my reflection as somebody, as a young person who grew up in the anti-apartheid struggle where I buried many of my friends and comrades, uh, was at funerals every other weekend and so on. Um, what young people in South Africa say to us now is there's a big difference between you all as young people fighting the apartheid monster and us as young people in the moment that we find ourselves in. And they say that, and they write, they say that however bad things were when you all were young, standing up for justice and so on, you all had hope. You all could see a pathway where things could get better, right? But we now are living in a world where the very planet we live on is becoming unlivable as a result of the choices, especially the dominant nations made historically and fostered that through colonialism, whether it's on our energy system, our food system, our economic system, our transport system, everything, right, is all putting profit before people, 
right? And that system has now driven us to a point where those who get power, right, through elections, not through democracy necessarily, I'm going to say through elections, right? Important uh, distinction. Yeah. Uh, then hell-bent to use that power to benefit those closest to them in economic, you know, either political cronies, business cronies, family members, and so on. And you're seeing that in country after country, including in Europe, in US, and so on, not just as is uh, often comfortably done by the global north, where they try to present it as this is some global south kind of disease, right? Because let's be very clear that there are two types of corruption. It's small-scale corruption and big-scale corruption. The small-scale corruption when a police officer or a immigration officer tries to give you a hard time to bribe you so that you don't get the fine. It's bad. It shouldn't happen. But that money circulates within the country, right? I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I'm just saying the impact of it is not as devastating. To the individuals who have to live through it, it's very devastating. And therefore, I'm very active in the anti-corruption movement. But... The big scale corruption is happening in the extractive industries, in oil, coal, gas, mining, all of that. And for that corruption to happen, it's not possible without the collusion, participation, engagement, conniving of those that sit in the global north, right? that control our economic system, control our banking systems, and so on. So for all of those reasons, I can understand that young people feel the sense of hopelessness, which is a horrendously problematic feeling for them to be having. But we have to start with understanding why they're feeling that. And to be honest, they have every reason to actually feel that, right? Because, you know, in our time, we could look around the world, we could see, hey, there's something positive happening in this country and there's something positive happening in this country and colonialism is being defeated here and colonialism is being defeated there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, right now, what are the sources of positivity? In fact, South Africa, sadly, in 30 years ago, was seen as one of those like success stories. And today, look at what we have in South Africa. We have a totally, totally corrupt regime, right, which looks less and less like a legitimate po political party and more and more like a sophisticated criminal enterprise, right? A scale of corruption uh, that also has a, you know, multi-layered in so many ways and so on. And when corruption, when they attack with corruption, then the easiest default is to use race, xenophobia, all of those things, uh, you know, again, the othering. Yeah. But why it is to prevent themselves. So what my message to young people is twofold. The first is, in this moment of history where we live, that we find ourselves in, pessimism is a luxury we simply cannot afford that the pessimism of our analysis can best be overcome by the creativity of our thought, our action, and our courage. The second message to young people is, it is not too late to turn things around. And don't underestimate how broken things currently are. And because things are as broken as they are, economic system, virtually all our systems are crumbling, right? In this brokenness is the best time for progressive, alternative, transformative ideas to emerge. At the moment, the problem we have is that those that control our political and economic systems, as we saw after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and as we're seeing now in the sort of post-COVID moment that we find ourselves in, their instinct and their approach is all about when, when the, and let's be clear, the global financial crisis and COVID really exposed the brokenness of our world, the inequality in the world, 
the fact that so many people live in such object poverty and, you know, you had heads of state making decisions about lockdowns and so on and then breaking it themselves and leaving poor people to suffer without the means to do a lockdown properly, for example. And what we needed after the global financial crisis and what we need even more urgently right now is not their approach, which is all about system recovery, system protection, and system maintenance. What is needed critically is system innovation, system transformation, and system redesign. We would be kidding ourselves that we're going to get out of this crisis through incremental tinkering and baby steps in the right direction and so on. However, in a polarized world, how do you do big systemic change? Yeah. Right? You've got to recognize that the approach of activism itself must change, right? That demonizing the enemy or those that hold different views from you, right, and making them a permanent enemy is not a smart thing to do. One of the things we learned during the anti-apartheid struggle was what helps you move forward is by understanding there's a people's camp and there's an oppressor camp, right? Those that want to maintain the status quo and perpetuate injustice. And that good activism is about constantly saying, you know, if you have the working class here, you have the middle class here, you have the bourgeoisie there, from all of them, how do you get more and more of them to veer towards the people's camp? And yes, you know, in the jargon, we talk about the vacillating petty bourgeoisie, which they will shift based on their interests, you know, very, very easily. But the challenge of activism is to get the middle class to understand, listen, your interests are with the working people, right? And if you do not ensure that the working people have basic dignity and basic rights and a certain level of living, whatever privilege you are acquiring, your privilege will always be threatened. The more that you have will always be something that's going to impact on your mental health and erode your mental health and so on. So in this moment of crises, some have called it the poly crisis. In a book that I wrote in 2010, I called it uh, boiling point. I call it boiling point. Uh, how can citizen action change the world? Uh, some people have called it uh, um, a perfect storm or convergence of crises and so on. So in this moment that we find ourselves in, it's incumbent on us to remember what Albert Einstein once said when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. So activism has to be much smarter, much more strategic, and must look at the contradictions that is found within our collective efforts. Yeah. So, for example, international NGOs, uh, two of which I served, uh, Greenpeace and Amnesty, and the rest of the community, which is completely dominated even today by the global north, right? must now understand that we cannot have organizations that say the right things, have the right policies on paper, but are fundamentally structurally racist on the other end, right? And let's be very clear, when we talk about global majority, uh, global North and global South, what are we talking about? We're talking about, in the global South, the overwhelming global majority, and the global north, we're talking about a very small global minority when you think about the terms. The way even the term international community is used, right? You know, it's used in a way that just doesn't resonate anymore, right? Because you've got, you know, India and China alone are one third of the world's population. They don't have a seat on the, uh, in, in you know, okay, China oh, does... Seat. Uh, in the Security Council, but uh, you know, you look at a country like Indonesia, fourth largest population in the world. What power do they have yeah. at the international level? Uh, Nigeria has a population of in excess of hundred million. 
you know, and you got, you know, you look at the World Bank, which is supposed to be this respected institution, which is still governed by a one dollar one vote, and you look at the World Bank and the IMF, there's a arrangement between the U.S. and Europe that the managing director of the World Bank will be an European, and the managing director or the president of the World Bank will always be an American, right? I mean, what kind of openness and governance uh, <laughs> you're seeing from those that preach good governance, right? So when you've got a system that is broken as this, when you've got a media environment and a communications environment that is heavily stacked against you, and when we are not winning fast enough and big enough in terms of a progressive agenda, then it's incumbent on us to actually do what Amilcar Cabral, the leader of the Guinea-Bissau anti-colonial movement said, we should tell no lies and claim no easy victories. And that's the moment we are in. Tell no lies and claim no easy victories. We are not winning fast enough. We're not winning big enough. And our institutions sometimes replicate and reproduce the very injustices that we are seeking to address, especially those movements that actually are dominant in the global north. So we need to talk about all of these things very openly right now. There's yeah. no time for BS, <laughs> right? Right. Really, we, you know, we are fighting for our very survival as a species. Yeah. So when you have that situation, we have to look at some of the big problems with activism. Right. So one I've identified when our movements reflect and reproduce some of the very things that we are fighting against, which is racial privilege and so on. The other thing that we have to address is that the biggest challenge that activism faces is a communications deficit. That we are not able to communicate in a language and in a culturally sensitive way that reaches the people that need to be reached with sufficient urgency and in sufficient numbers. And part of the problem is, again, the domination of global activism by the global north, right? Where we actually talk very much in terms of policies and frameworks and principles and so on. And if the best case is climate, right? If you look at why we're failing so badly on climate, let me just be clear that activism, what it has achieved within the constraints of what it faces has been remarkable, right? Because the cards have been stacked against us. There's been so much of sacrifice, so many heroic struggles and so on, and so many, you know, battles that have been won. But we we must concede we're winning the battles, but we're losing the overall war, right? And for justice. And so in that context, one of the reasons where I've landed in my reflections is that climate shows us very explicitly we try to communicate the urgency of climate through science, through facts, through figures, through lots of acronyms and jargons, all of which is over the heads of 95% of the people in the world, including educated people, right? Including educated people. So what when we look at fascism, and the emergent fascists in the world, from Donald Trump to uh, Orban in uh, Hungary, or the Italian leadership or the Front National in, 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 in France and so on, they don't worry about facts and figures. They don't even worry about the head. All of the narratives and the messaging is aimed at the heart, right? where they weaponize identity, they weaponize division, they, 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 they push a them versus us messaging and so on. And so part of what we need to do if progressive activism is to win is we have to start talking like ordinary human beings and less like bureaucrats, right? And by the way, every criticism I'm making, I have made the error. So I, 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 I come very much 
from that perspective. And and then you know the third thing I would say is a lot of the people that we need to reach have not had the benefit of education. They are not, you know, the information superhighway has left them behind on potholes and so on. They're not really caught up with the majority of people that we need to reach, right? And we sometimes get carried away with the voices of the middle classes, even in progressive movements. And we think, oh, because this number of people were mobilized, therefore we have sufficient base and sufficient support. So let me give a very practical example about how we can think about framing in a different way. Mm -hmm. So let's say you and I decided that one of the biggest challenges in the world is a broken, unjust, brutal economic system. Just for argument, say we agreed on that. And then we say, okay, let's launch a campaign five days from now to address this problem, right? And assuming I said, well, let the slogan be, let's smash the capitalist system, okay? Now, the day before we launch the campaign, think about a continuum, right? And all the people who agree with us that the economic system must be fundamentally changed are are here, and then all the people who disagree on a continuum away from us. Let's say it looks like this the day before we launch the campaign. The day we launch the campaign with with that slogan, guess what's happened? We've pushed people away because so many people have been led to believe that because they have a job at McDonald's or Walmart or Coca-Cola, that they are major sort of stakeholders in the capitalist system. So if you are framing something that threatens people's jobs, yeah. right? Which is about their survival. It's about putting food on the table. And it's also about get- their sense of self. Yeah. Yeah, because the, the some of them, their whole identity and their networks and everything comes from that, right? Yeah. But if we framed it as, let's build an economic system that includes everybody and doesn't, uh, harm the environment. Yeah, maybe it doesn't sound as sexy as the first one, <laughs> but what you are doing is you're building narratives yeah. that allow you to build a communications bridge with the people that are not with us, because activism cannot be simply organizing and mobilizing and consolidating the people that agree with us in the first place, right? And then you just talk in that echo chamber and you convince yourself about just how committed we are, our, just our courses and so on, when in fact sometimes you're becoming smaller and smaller in terms of number and you're leaving the vast majority of people behind. So one of the things that we've neglected, very practical thing that I'm saying to young people, remind yourself about the power of arts and culture, Right? And what we need right now is to energize the notion of artivism, right? Yeah, about that. We can only move people when we respect their song, their dance, the movies, the, the games they play online, the music they listen to through streaming, and go and meet them where they are. And I'll end with a very uh, funny example somewhat. So I was on an inflatable boat going to occupy an oil rig in Greenland in 2011. Hmm. And the sea was very rough while we left the Greenpeace ship and we were going on a small inflatable boat. And my colleagues could see that I was very, very scared because I don't swim very well. And so, so, uh, actually, I don't swim well at all. (laughs) So they said to me, no, don't worry, if you fall in the ocean, Kumi will be able to, you'll survive at least two hours in the Arctic where you could die with hypothermia if you don't have proper clothing. He said, no, you got proper thing. You'll survive two hours and we'll fish you out. I looked at the size of the waves and I thought, my God, it might take about two hours for them to find me. And then I had this horrible thought. I looked at the banner that I was carrying, which said, stop Arctic destruction. And I realized that if I kicked it there, and that was the last action that I engaged in my entire life, 
that 99% of my friends, family, and colleagues back home in Africa wouldn't have a clue what that slogan or campaign was about. In fact, my brother, uh, when I landed in prison, goes on television and try to, you know, get support, you know, for me to be released and so on. And one of the journalists asked him, so what exactly is Kumi fighting for there? And he said, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't fully understand. But he must be really committed to it because he can't even swim to save his backside, right? <laughs> so anyway, after a short time in prison there in Greenland, I get back home to South Africa and I'm chatting with some kids in my family. And one of the kids says to me, Uncle Kumi, what a stupid slogan. Stop Arctic destruction. Nobody understood what you were talking about. And then I said, what would have been a better slogan? And she said, save Santa Claus now. Right? But you think about the brilliance of what she was saying. She was saying, you activists, you project your consciousness on us. If in Africa, the only connection that people have with that part of the world is that Santa Claus is chilling there for the better part of the year. <laughs> I should tell you, I was telling this story like this to a group of German parliamentarians about 18 months ago. And, and when it was over, one of the parliamentarians, because I said it in such a convincing way, came up to me and said, Kumi, I just want to check. You do know that Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, but but the brilliance of what you were saying is absolutely activism projects your consciousness, your theories, your uh, you know your human rights protocols, uh, your climate change modeling, and so on. All of which is a conversation that is happening by. A particular kind of elite, uh, elites within our resistance movement, and we've had this problem. Yeah. Historically, we've had this problem, and that is why you know, in many struggles, we have so many factions and fractions and divisions that emerge because yeah. people will want to spend time fighting about the finer distinctions of theory, right, and 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 do it in a self-indulgent way to be right when what we need right now is to be effective. So yeah. there's a kind of framing that we need, which is centropic framing, you know, which, 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 which basically frames our demands in a way that consciously is thinking, how do we win over the 30% of people that voted for Trump? If in the United States, for example, people take a view Trump supporters are deplorable and we just wipe them all, you know, leave them all uh, to their own devices. That is tactically and strategically a terrible idea. 30% of the people, as is being shown, as it looks like there's a possibility you could get re-elected, is far too many people for you to ignore. So therefore, activism must consciously say to itself right now, our task is to reach those people that have a right to be part of the conversation and part of these struggles. And we need to be more accessible in the way we approach uh, our communications and also recognize, of course, the communications deficit is partly subjective in the sense of what I spoke about, about us being jargonistic and so on. But let's also be honest, the bigger challenge with the communications deficit is a media infrastructure that is so narrowly controlled by corporate and state entities that make any ideas that contest the status quo so difficult to actually break through. And yes, social media offers some outlet, but whether we like it or not, the mainstream media of the world um, a huge is, still, is still holding lots of power. Thank you so much. Kumi. It's been a pleasure. I mean, it's been an absolute energizing, uh, a boost of energy to listen to you. Oh, thank you so much.